okay, Michael. How are you? Very well. So is it Mike Hi. or Michael? <laughs> Great. It's uh, it's super awesome to have you on the show. Uh, really you. excited. Hi. I was just telling uh, the viewers how I'm really keen to know about the overall Tripoto story and, and the entire journey of how you guys built it. So uh, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for taking time on a Sunday evening. Uh, it means a lot. Most welcome. Super. It's like to be here. <laughs> Great. So, Michael, so if I could start off, uh, you know, if you could talk us through, you know, the entire idea of how did Tripoto come about, uh, what were you thinking when you started Tripoto, and run us through the very early phases of Tripoto. So, Anruth, my co-founder Anruth and I uh, met in business school uh, in 2011, actually. And one of the reasons he connected was because he wanted to really start a tech company. We were very young then. Uh, tech was just taking off and we wanted to start a tech company. Uh, and he wanted to do something in travel. And that was uh, certain, right? Uh, so, as we got around talking, we realized, you know, how painful the whole travel planning process is. How we, both of us would actually go through hundreds and hundreds of blogs for endless hours just to frame our perfect itinerary. <laughs> And what we really wanted to do was, you know, we said, hey, you know, most of the actual good content's lost on the internet. So why don't we bring together all the content in one common platform? Uh, and uh, for us, travel was more uh, community driven, right? We believed in the power of uh, user generated content in personalized recommendations. And we, we thought to ourselves, okay, that's a long term vision. Let's try and do this. Let's try and build this product. Let's try and, um, uh, like uh, put our vision in actually in paper. So as we, we started, we while we were still in college, we actually uh, created an MVP, uh, and we dabbled around with it. We play, um, we our initial thoughts were that we build the product, pe people come in magically, and you know, uh, they start using it, and <laughs> and then and then just as the hearts fluttered, uh, dollars start coming in right day one. That, right. So that's what you know you would think <laughs> if you were younger. <laughs> so. Uh, I think, uh, so it obviously things didn't take off uh, so easily. Uh, so Anrit went back, went to, after ISB, went to Rocket Internet in Dubai, and I went back to my family business. Uh, but we kept talking to each other, especially about Tripoto and the whole concept of Tripoto, right? And we kept wondering why, uh, what went wrong. Um, I mean, and one of the reasons he uh, came up was that we didn't put enough effort. Uh, so if you hear most of the advice that people give you is that if uh, you know, build an MVP, if it takes off, quit your jobs and uh, like you know, start your company. For us, it was the opposite. Actually, things didn't take off. Uh, we uh, then thought, you know, there must, there's nothing wrong with the idea. It's just a question of uh, putting in more uh, work into the product. So we both quit our jobs back in 2013 and we took an apartment and started off from there. Uh, that's the beginning of Tripoto. So I think yeah. uh, one of the really fascinating things of Tripoto for me has been the way you, like you correctly said about the entire community aspect, right? I think, like you said, I think it's it's been very early on from the point of saying, hey, how do we kind of harness the power of the traveler community itself to kind of uh, build something of value that's that's both from a creation and a consumption perspective, right? So could you talk us through, I mean, what really goes into building one such committee? Because while it's it's great to see once it's it's done, I'm sure there must have been that that journey of you know yep. building that community. How was it? The, the initial bit was very very difficult. Uh, you know, you can't build communities just by you know advertising or throwing money at it, right? Uh, communities are built on a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, wanting a, a larger objective that it serves, right? And uh, so what we, we initially did was that we actually wrote personalized emails to more than 5,000 bloggers around the world and more than 1,000 Skype calls. And the objective was to actually explain why we were building the company, uh, what is the vision behind it, because the product that people see initially is not what you is the, eventually end up building out. The line, yeah. right? uh, so it's very important for us to get that because if you think about it, you can the product is easy to build. I mean, that's step one, right? But once, but for us, we didn't, without content, there were no users. Cycles, and, kind uh, of. Uh, yeah, and without you, people reading the content, there was no incentive for the uh, creators to create content. So at that point in time, it's very important, again, to have these conversations, personalized conversations, keep people engaged, 
so it took a long long time for us to actually kick start the, uh, the project like we would have initial set of creators who actually create the content but you know uh, travel content changes uh, and uh, that's our vision and that's why we wanted to create it because it, things change very quickly and regularly right so you want li- up to date live content from people so it was it took time for us to it took us more than 6 months actually to get things moving and i think once people saw the value in the publishing platform uh realize how useful it is to actually be able to chat to people who were following you for because they liked your travel content or really needed personalized recommendations and once you have that sense of where you've helped someone a fellow travel uh, member then i think that's when you develop the hooks into uh, getting more and more people uh, using the platform so did you guys start off by writing your own travel stories as well no so uh, so that so that's the difficult part right so we were very certain that we didn't want to create uh, have an editorial led uh, approach to content we wanted users to create their content so that was the difficult part so if you imagine you you come into the platform it's empty right the first user who created content so but we were very very sure you know we knew it was a more difficult approach to doing it but we didn't want to compromise on our vision and i think that's what's led to our success now so and and also in generally when talk about community right uh, the overall uh, censorship around the community led platform is is always a very very uh, how to put a very dicey thing right because you you don't want to be because when you censor too much you become editorial like you rightly said right at the same time uh, the whole idea of a community is also about how interesting and and useful the content is how do you guys draw those lines and and could talk us through like your thought process behind that so if uh, i think what you're referring to is basically sponsored content right or editorial content so what happens there is that you need to uh, establish a sort of trust with your users and you can't break that trust so whenever something is editorial based you need to make sure that people know that it's editorial based right so that disclaimer needs to go out uh, as soon as they log in as soon as they read the content so and that trust gets built over time when people start trusting the voice of Tripoto as well so right now for example we have uh, our editorial team creates a lot of content uh, but because that's what we see is important that the community members should know about certain things or there some maybe there could be undiscovered destinations uh, they could be curated collect, uh, recommendations by editorial team so that so if, so building trust not just as a platform as Tripoto but also for the editors themselves individually that becomes really important and you have to give uh you have to be honest and you have to make sure that you don't break your users trust and in in sense of some of the time you've built that community to now which is uh, i mean how many now how many people do they come and create content now on a so monthly basis the covid we were doing around 8 million uh, active uh, wow. users right uh, we have more than 1.5 million users so that's uh, and i still remember like, going back to the old days when we had 1000 users per minute We, there was a cause of celebration we were very very happy and now we've seen it grow like to more than half a million uh, daily active users uh, so that's the scale at which we are working at right now so at, at this half a million kind of a space right? i mean sometimes do you feel that the overall the at some scale the dilution starts kicking in right how have you guys managed to ensure that for example there could be zillion articles on let's say goa for example right so how do you ensure that the kind of content that keeps getting created like you said one of the key things about travel content is about how accurate and, and real time it is as well right so how do you go about figuring that out how do you do you have any kind of so one is that super uh, content is content right as long as it meets our quality standards in terms of it's not being plagiarized uh, it's the, all the contents authentic and there's a certain level of uh, quality checks that we do from the back end as well side so editorial team it gets approved so for us is that it's a traveler is creating content whether it's in the form of pictures videos articles uh, so that needs to go out right uh, and everyone's experience is different the way you travel is very different from the way i travel so uh, if you create content that might not serve me as a user but it might serve a thousand other users right so that's very important and that's the uh, and that's why having a thousand articles on goa might not be might still be very very useful because it serves different sets of audiences right right talking about travel right so like how how are you as a traveler so what's your favorite destination what's what's the one trip that you really are always fond of so in terms of my favorite destination i think my wife and i love goa we got married in goa as, uh, as well uh, so but uh, one i mean the two sides of it uh, i think earlier i love i love jordan because i love history i love 
adventure so that was very very like one of my most memorable trips uh, but now as i now that i have a family i'm much older i i mean i loved maldives and i just want to go back because uh, there's a charm to doing nothing <laughs> at a destination yeah i think maldives really uh, is one of the top uh, places where you can just go unwind and it's something you're constrained by the whole geography itself right especially now so i mean I'm, now you stuck at home uh, you really want to go out in the open seas and uh, just explore so you, right so talking about jordan actually i think uh, it'd be super interesting to hear your perspective jordan because it's i think one of those very undiscovered kind of destinations right uh, i've heard of people doing road trips in jordan itself so maybe one two minutes on the destination itself for viewers so for uh, uh, we also did a road trip actually we went to uh, we drove from i mean from uh, to dead sea wadi ram you drove to all of these destinations because that's the easiest way to travel across your jordan it's not a very big country uh one petra i think is absolutely beautiful uh it's one of the heritage sites uh, that and i think more and more people need to explore it simply because it's you actually see history walk amidst history right you uh, and uh, and i i went there for about 4 days uh, went from petra to uh, wadi ram to the dead sea and i think that i mean you've, you've only seen the dead sea in pictures where people are floating uh, reading a magazine must have been a so, surreal experience right just to this is not be i think especially for people like me who can't swim i think that's the best way to kind of experience uh, the sea without having to worry so yeah it was a good, a good experience but you can't stay there for more than 20 minutes in the sea uh, apparently uh, you get burned So, so you can only oh, hang okay. out at four twenty, and then you have to come out, <laughs> and then uh, rub yourself with mud. <laughs> Crazy, super. I think uh, one of the things that I'm very keen to also understand from your perspective, having built report on the community, is also to see uh, how much of this entire COVID scene has kind of changed traveler perspective. Given you guys are engaging with with travelers and and creators, right? like you'd be one of the most uh, closest people to what's changing and what's happening what are your thoughts there what are you seeing and feeling on the ground what we see and we've actually done surveys with our users uh, and we passed them the same question actually ki what, what do you think will happen in the next 6 months 9 months uh, where do you see yourself traveling and one of the first things we see is that uh, domestic travel will pick up and and the two phases to that one is in terms of having short road trips uh, and going to and doing vacations right so people will need i mean i think travel is becoming will become essential for the people's mental recovery from the lockdown so a lot of people will be taking road trips i think once things uh, uh, at least uh, when if the covid situation dies down slightly i think more and more people will travel domestically at least with it for road trips and uh, for uh, and doing a lot of vacations in terms of vacations also i think how people choose destinations will become very very, very different so uh, boutique properties will probably pick up first because uh, because the lower concentration much, of people smaller. yeah exactly and you'll also be most likely choosing brands which you trust in terms of maintaining a certain standard in terms of hygiene and sanitation uh so that's the first phase that we see over the next 6 months i think after 6 months what we we'll, uh, envision is that uh, and once interstate travel becomes more accessible and once people are more and more comfortable taking flights then uh, luckily for us in india the main tourist destinations have not been badly affected if you look at ladakh if you look at himachal uttarakhand andaman i think they have sub uh, 50 cases uh, the northeastern states and northeast as well yeah uh, northeast has uh, covid free as of now as we speak uh, goa is again covid free so luck i think once uh, people are able or trust the fact that they can get on buses trains uh, flights then these destinations will pick up uh, so inter- then international travel it's anyone's guess right because uh, it will also depend upon the travel will be mainly be restricted to covid free countries for example uh, maybe bhutan uh, sri lanka might benefit because they haven't had to meet vietnam it. vietnam i've heard has been doing really well they've opened up a couple of spots as well already yeah. but people need to also trust the fact that uh, you know one is traveling to the country uh, what what are the airlines doing in terms of uh, they're Checking. having with in terms of you know um, uh, social distancing uh, they also talks about having middle rows uh, being vacated 
but that also means that flights will be running at 65% capacity, which means that the airline tickets will have to go up for flights to be sustainable. Uh, so there's a lot of issues. I mean, Etihad and uh, Emirates on the other, you know, recently started uh, testing uh, for at the airport itself uh, and yeah. checking for. Uh, so I think airlines, countries will uh, will have to will pay their own guidelines. Uh, you, because social distancing will become very, very important. Hotels will have to practice some form of social distancing. Uh, so for them, they'll probably have to, uh, op again, operate at 60, 50, 60% capacity, ensure that there are no buffet tables anymore, <laughs> uh, make sure that, uh, and at the same point in time, they also need to in incentivize travelers to actually book those hotels because, uh, as you all know, it's not just a question of safety right now. It's also a question of being... You know, uh, are people do people have enough income to uh, travel because everyone's been badly affected because of the COVID nineteen? So there are a lot of factors in play. Uh, but again, the silver lining in all of this is that uh, the millions and millions of dollars that Indians usually spell, spend traveling abroad will most likely be spent in India at least for the next twelve months. Good. Uh, a couple of questions that are coming in. Uh, so I'm going to pick up one of them. Right. So one of them is. Uh, Clearly, uh, around there's some. Uh, this is about Voila. So you've re you recently released uh, released a new feature on the Android app called Voila. So a couple of them are keen to know about that. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah. So the uh, basic what what we realized is that people were not really uh, planning trips right now, right? Uh, because actively planning. So, but people still wanted to read a lot of travel content, wanted to uh, explore new destinations. So what we do we did with that we started creating a personalized newsfeed for people. Uh, to, to one discover new content and discover new experiences, uh, we actually recently also uh, enable people to uh, upload videos directly on the platform. So, for example, our uh, actually in the whole crisis now, one interesting data is that for us, the number of people who are creating content has gone up substantially. Right. Interesting. So, okay. uh, because you're sitting at home, you, I mean, you are document. There's a sense of nostalgia and re recounting your old memories and creating that content. So uh, that's gone up significantly. And with the news feed now, a, lo a lot of them are getting uh, like the incre increased viewership in their content through because it's more personalized. And like you right, asked earlier, how do, uh, does a thousand Goa article really serve any purpose? Yes, because again, it's, it's personalized and it really uh, helps everyone. I think there's one more question coming up. Uh, your, your recommended research on uh, preferred locations, I think you mentioned, I think Goa, Arunachal, uh, Ladakh, and Andaman. Are there any other, I mean, in, from a sh short staycation perspective, the while you touched upon it, uh, do you think that the overall uh, capability and infrastructure uh, is, is there around to support such surge in staycations? So, uh, the way we look at it, look at it, it'll be more, it won't be a huge spike, right? Initially, it'll be more like a tick shaped recovery, right? We've only seen the downturn now, the up the recovery will be, the number of visitors will go up slowly. So uh, I don't think immediately there'll be a huge upsurge in the number of uh, tourists going into these destinations. Uh, infrastructure wise, yes, we do need a lot of work. Uh, but I think infrastructure is built over years and decades, not immediately. Uh, so, and I think uh, government regulations have become really, really important here because uh, forget about whether the infrastructure can support it. Is it viable for people to congregate at one location? Uh, I mean, a thousand people are congregated at, uh, at one particular tourist destination spot, right? Uh, for example, I know this in uh, Dubai. What they're doing is that most of the tourist attractions ensuring that uh, fewer people congregate. Like, you know, they have limits on how many people can congregate next to the Dubai fountain, for example, or next to the Burj Khalifa. So, uh, infrastructure, I think, more than infrastructure, the regulations that the government needs to put in place in these de different destinations need to be uh, formulated. Uh, the other question coming up is, uh, what are some of the challenges that you faced while uh, starting Triporto? So let's say if you could talk about maybe top one or two things that you really had as challenges. So one is uh, key factors, again, uh, to build a company, you need a great team, right? Uh, That's true. And it's very, very difficult. Uh, building a great team is very, very difficult when you have very little money and very little and nothing except a big vision to sell, right? So uh, for us, uh, what we did when we were hiring people or getting people on board was ensuring that everyone who came on board shared one, our vision, our passion, and also like what uh, travelers, right? So 
because only a traveler can think from uh, at the at a traveler's problem, right? So and True. they were the only would basically and building a company takes a decade, and that's what we think will take what it takes to build a successful company. So if it takes a decade, then you need people who believe in you and believe in the long term vision, and not just they need it now. The second problem is that it takes time. and uh, building a company takes a lot of time uh, there are more downs and ups right uh, so you have to be emotionally uh, stable um, make sure that you celebrate the small successes and you tend to forget that because you could i mean you could go for months without seeing any traction but uh, you need to keep reminding yourself not to give up and i think uh, once people go through it and i give this advice to anyone who's starting up if you can get through the first year you probably uh, make a good a uh, great company but you have to get through and make sure that you survive the first year and not give up super i think uh, in some sense corona has kind of brought the entire travel industry to back to like day zero right so in some sense is like again a fresh start i'm assuming right so mm-hmm. how are you kind of going uh, any kind of thoughts you want to share in terms of how this last couple of months have been personally and also what it means for the company and what do you guys see as as things going forward so one is that for, i mean obviously it's a big shock for all of us for, for the uh, entire travel industry i don't think we were prepared for this level of a pan, uh, pandemic right so for us uh, what it's done is that we've uh, actually this while you're running a company there's a lot of important projects that get uh, sidelined because they're not a priority in terms of uh, business right so Uh, for us, it's been enable us to uh, uh, allocate our resources uh, to long term projects that and for the product to ensure that you know uh, the long term vision of the company remains intact. In terms from a business perspective, we again have to align with what we think will the new demand will be right. So uh, we work we work a lot with tourism boards, for example, uh, and luckily for us, we created we had created a lot of virtual content last year. so we creating a lot of virtual content for people to be engaged with right now right so uh, we launching uh, gigapixel for example with abu dhabi tourism in the next 2 uh, 3 weeks uh, so it's a question of how do you uh, can you get a pulse on what's going to happen next and can you uh, be ahead of the curve so for us it's all about thinking from that perspective like even uh, like i mentioned like you know how more and more people might take vacations might take short yeah. and get ways uh more and more people like in terms of the sort of hotels that they choose uh, working with our hotel partners in terms of communicating that uh, what levels of hygiene and sanitation do they maintain that becomes really really important so i think uh, right now is a good time for us to introspect uh and uh, clean up whatever mess you had in, internally in terms of <laughs> the product and, product and the things and you always tend to ignore yeah, yeah. you tend to automate a lot of things which you couldn't earlier right because uh, it's easier to put more, to put uh, people to uh, to solve a problem but sometimes you just need you know to solve it take the long road to solve a problem which we doing right now so yeah and uh, personally i think it's it's hard it's not easy uh, it's uh, because you have you now as a founder you're responsible for a lot of people's livelihood as well right so having that communication with people in terms and explaining the downturn explaining how we uh, will envision coming out of it when data keeps changing every week especially coming going back in march things were changing very quickly right i mean beginning of march we were fairly confident about uh, how things were looking in spite of getting news from china and uh, the rest of the world and italy uh, but uh, things change so quickly and then you have to adapt to that change and uh, also communicate make sure that you communicate uh, uh, to your employees uh, what you are thinking so that becomes important yeah so one question that's come out is uh, uh, how does how does one become a featured author and reporter i think while i let you i let you answer that question i also have a addendum question i've always had and uh, i would like to understand your take on the entire travel influencer as a segment right because i think uh, that's a segment that's, that's always been very difficult to understand and and figure out how is it good bad for brands so both those questions okay so how do you become a travel influencer by creating great content right i mean a travel uh, featured travel right on reporto uh, we have an editorial team that sits and skims through all the content that's published on reporto that is publicly viewable on reporto and uh, if it meets our quality standards we see that you have you highly engaged you creating enough content our, commu- our 
content team or community team will reach out to you and feature you on Tripotu. So that's number one. Uh, getting to your question on influencers, they play a very important role, right? So, for example, even right now, uh, as we talk about COVID-19 and how you know, the hotel industry will recover, we actually will be sending out a lot of our Tripotu influencers to experience these properties because they are I will be your first-hand reviewers and showcasing what it means to... Uh, if, is it safe to travel? Uh, are the uh, sanitation and hygiene standards being maintained? Uh, and actually showcase that experience to millions of people around the community. Uh, and these influencers have the... I mean, people also follow their influencers, at least on Tripoto, because they know that, one, their core skill set or their core, core goal is travel, right? So... If brands want to reach out to them, uh, and uh, it's a very niche and targeted audience that they will cater to. It's not, I mean, you could go on Facebook, you could go on Instagram, for example, but we don't really know who, like, what's happening there, right? You could have thousands and thousands of followers from different life, from lifestyle, from fashion, uh, but at least on Tripoto, when you have these travel influencers, they're very targeted and very uh, and focused only on travel. So that makes it life simpler for the brands and they know what they are getting. And in terms of brands actually trying to figure out, because a lot of the brands now, I'm assuming after COVID, are actually I think should a little bit more forward because a lot of comments on uh, people not able to see your entire uh, face. So maybe either it will the camera a little bit. Yeah, yeah, now, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, much better now. Yeah. Great. So I think coming back, I think brands are, do you think brands are going to get a lot more, uh, how do you put it, ROI driven post COVID because uh, there's going to be a lot more lot lesser budgets to play with and a lot more uh, scrutiny on how much able to make out of the customer, right? So how do you see that changing? And given influencers have largely been looked at as a kind of a segment, where it's very difficult to tie on ROI. Uh, yeah. How do you see that changing post-COVID? So, uh, yes. I mean, I think in the influencer market, for example, is not as developed in India as in China or in the West, right? In the West, if you look, a lot of the influencer content is... Uh, or influencer campaigns are ROI driven, right? So they, you know, they give you a coupon code and then they, tra they track your performance based on that. And in case an influencer actually delivers results, it actually works out better for them to work on an ROI based uh, payment system. Uh, if you look at how uh, brands will spend, yes, I think travel brands especially will definitely spend only on uh, ROI driven campaigns. But I think a lot of uh, like, hotels, a lot of destinations might actually need to spend money in terms of communicating to people what they're doing, right? Uh, I think the most important thing that people can do right now or tourism boards can do right now or hoteliers can do right now is communicate. Whether you spend money uh, or not, or just create content on your own and just talk about how what you're doing to combat COVID-19 because people will be initially scared and fearful of uh, visiting any destination, right? Or visiting your hotel. So what can you do to allay that fear? You need not spend a lot of money on branding, but you need to address the issue hand, uh, hands uh, uh, head on. Okay. There's a question coming in on the comment section. Uh, Hi, guys. I was listening to Brian, the Airbnb co-founder the other day, and he said it's been at least a year for traveling industry to revive. What are your thoughts? Maybe I'll go first, then you could also uh, chime in, Andrew. I think uh, my sense is that... Uh, at least what you've seen in Pick Your Trail uh, is clearly that a lot of uh, customers are keen to start traveling. It's just that, like you said, clearly there's a lot of uncertainty around airlines, hotels, and, and borders opening up per se. But uh, our sense is, like you clearly said, I think similar uh, thoughts, uh, the shorter, you know, self-contained, my own car, safety of my car kind of travel will start first, followed by domestic, where clearly, like you said, there's Goa, there's Andamans, there's Northeast, bunch of destinations, uh, but a lot depends also on how, how soon airlines open up for a lot of this, right? So I think uh, there's going to be, that's going to be the biggest challenge and how soon, I, I'd like to believe that there, there'll be this early adopter segment. Uh, in some sense, if you look at it, uh, it's, it's always going to be insta worthy to say, hey, I was the first in Philippines post COVID. It's like a new era of travel coming through. So in some sense, there's a lot of at least chatter in internal groups where people are like very quick to say, hey, can I be the first to kind of go to that particular country post-COVID? So I think uh, you will have those early adopters, predominantly either backpackers or double income, no kids, where there's very little risk back at home of uh, passing on the internet and your, your lifestyle is a lot more safe. I think uh, 
but i think for normal travel coming back at least yeah i think a year year and a half is is a good enough timeline provided there's a vaccine that comes out is my sense would love to hear your thoughts same yeah i think it, the, like i said uh, we can break it up into three parts short short haul holidays i mean we can get away uh, where people can drive to could pick up in 6 months domestic holidays hopefully pick up in a year international i mean even domestic holidays it really depends upon regulations in between on interstate travel right uh, will different states allow you to, to uh, tourists to come to those destinations for example i think kerala is not allowing tourists until november if i'm not mistaken uh, then international travel really depends upon whether the borders really open up right now no one's really thinking of going to europe america uh, i mean italy spain are no one's going to go there for the next year right and whether and it's not a question of people wanting it's also a question of whether the governments will allow it whether people in those destinations will welcome tourists or not right that's uh, so i think that's why having made, i mean i read this article on how people might actually have an immunity sort of passport everyone needs to have health checks before getting on a flight yeah, right that's right? true yeah because i think even passport, even visa free destinations like maldives uh, sri lanka thailand are also mulling about uh, making i think the way a, a wax a, a kind of a test could become mandatory before you yeah. board the plane yeah. exactly yeah. and that's everyone more comfortable right i mean like i said etihad and uh, emirates are already doing it emirates, uh, yeah. so it makes the locals more comfortable makes you more comfortable sitting on an air fl- uh, flight with maybe 100 other people uh, you feel safe i mean so a lot of issues need to be addressed both from the com- from the airline hotel government perspective right all need to work together come together to come to to uh, come up with a solution and i think it won't i mean right now it sounds uh, what if you read the news it's i mean you uh, probably won't it's like that point of that word but uh, i think uh, i mean as humans like you rightly said uh, we would we need to travel right uh, it's we all cooped up in our homes right now uh, we want to go out uh, amidst nature whether it's to beaches to the mountains so all of us will eventually travel it's just a question of when and when is just a speculation right now uh, based on multiple other factors but yeah 6 so months, 12 I, months 18 to 24 months when, yeah. okay if i had to put you in the hot spot which was a question coming in uh, when do you think the season will restart so when do you think uh, let's say let's pick up uh, uh let's say let's say for example goa right or northeast when do you think uh, it's going to start at least some bit of tourism uh, goa luckily i think maybe by december of october november december something was we like i said the early adopters will uh, probably travel there i mean mumbai i mean at least people from mumbai will be driving to goa mumbai pune will be driving to goa for sure i mean not for sure sorry i shouldn't say that <laughs> but i think people will uh, that will, will pick up there Uh, and there's one question coming in from the backpacking community right so uh, what how do you think the entire backpacking uh, community would change undergo change uh, post covid given that you know the overall concept of couch travel uh, right all of that could come into question what's your what are your thoughts around how is it going to affect the backpacking community so one is that uh, it may happen that travel becomes more expensive right it might become a luxury item so uh, like i said we talked about airlines being more expensive maybe buses and trains might get more expensive so that might uh, affect uh, backpackers uh, in terms of uh, how do they choose how do they choose their hostels or accommodation or airbnbs right uh, because one i think from from an airbnb perspective you, you, the host needs to be comfortable with you coming in as a tourist and you need to be comfortable with the facilities you stay in right yeah. uh, what we see is that at least in terms of home stays probably you might want to book an entire home but as a backpacker you want to book a room right uh, would you like to stay i mean i'm not sure whether you stay in a hostel and stay on bunk beds with six other people so it really depends uh, it's an individual choice in the end right because at least the hostels will open up they will practice their own forms of social distancing maybe they'll have more private rooms uh, but that becomes it becomes much more expensive Uh, so for that segment i think they'll uh, they'll have to spend a little more uh, to travel in the next year so my sense on this is very similar as well right because i think backpacking as a community has largely been fueled on the back of you know either couch surfing or very uh, like bunk beds common bathrooms and stuff like that i think uh, overall given the overall hygiene factor would go up my sense is it's it's going to get slightly more expensive uh, to backpack and this is where a lot of uh, 
hotel chains especially in southeast asia they are able to price it really well they might be able to attract the bulk of the crowd uh, to spend is my sense as well right yes. coming back i think sorry go ahead so it's a very delicate balance right for uh, hotels because uh, not hotels but for hostels uh, to get back online they'll probably have to have fewer guests coming into the hostels to maintain social distancing if they reduce the prices then it, the business becomes uns- unsustainable so it's a very delicate balance and it's very very difficult for them as well uh, it's a difficult scenario yeah uh so one question coming in is how is travel industry players collaborating with indian government to develop unexplored places in india wow that's a very deep question yeah it's a very deep question it's more i think these conversations are happening at uh, multiple levels uh, we've been part of some committee as well in terms of recommending what infrastructure developments need to happen because everyone believes especially I, this is a great i mean if you think of it forget everything that bad is happening it's a great opportunity for india uh, to showcase what it's got right we all talk about unexplored india incredible india uh, but the problem is that the infrastructure available to support tourists like you mentioned so i think right now maybe the government uh, and the tourism industry we need to get together and really, uh, get this fast track in terms of ensuring that there enough uh, hotels and accommodations and tourist destinations enough uh, infrastructure to support people getting there uh, but all of this will take time as in it's uh, they even talk they were the last uh, committee we had we were talking about having developing cruises uh, river cruises across india getting that more and more developed but uh, maybe that might take a back seat because well um, the cruise industry is uh, is something which uh, maybe will take a long long time to recover more than uh, what we're talking about right now in terms of domestic travel i think also similar i think is also uh, would i think one one part of the problem like you rightly said is is the infrastructure i think what will also happen is all your major tourist hotspots might not be able to take in the same amount of crowds uh, given there will be restriction on social distancing right so there will be pent up demand i think for example a goa and a gokarna right i mean how do you kind of start equalizing demand and and, and that's going to be i think a huge challenge and like you said also an opportunity uh, for smaller towns to start becoming a lot more popular and if if they are doable to road then might be why just go to a kurg if you're able to do a couple of more other towns right and not necessarily kurg but again exactly. they are getting quality accommodation is going to be a challenge and i think uh, i think it's going to be very interesting but like you said i think it's a great opportunity for people to kind of explore india as well and then and then maybe it's if you're able to ride this wave the next 3 4 years we might we might boost domestic tourism a lot more than what would have otherwise grown exactly because i think from what i read more than 10 million people uh, go out travel outside india every year right so that's uh, a huge segment of people who are who have the money and uh, can ex- should explore india more than uh, any other destination yeah so other question coming in uh, with some major airlines uh, filing bankruptcy how is it going to affect the international travel industry like i said uh, one there'll be fewer routes uh, flights will definitely get more expensive uh, the ones that survive as well will probably have to operate at 65% capacity your uh, luckily fuel prices have gone down so well uh, that could be a good thing for the airline industry but uh, it'll be very very difficult See, this is because it's not just a question of airline i mean airline going bankrupt will have again fewer there'll be fewer competition and fewer airlines and fewer so I mean. uh, but also airports need to it's not just a question of people being comfortable sitting on a flight it's also about people being comfortable be, being at the airport right and that's where the government really comes in uh, last week uh, there were two british airways flights that landed at the same time in at heathrow and uh, used the same conveyor belt so there were more than 500 people waiting for their luggage right so uh, i mean if things like this happen then uh, you know it just creates the you know the, the biggest problem is fear right right now that we deal with so uh, everyone needs to work to alleviate those fears mine is very similar i think also what one thing i i kind of i don't know might be a wrong guess is that uh, my sense travel is largely been around discounting and and trying to figure out i think at least early demand i think people might might just have to do that at least in china that's what's happened domestically people have kind of uh, slashed prices initially till people kind of got used to it because i think the supply and demand problem like i said clearly fear is a significant driving uh, uh, decision maker right so i think some bit of price in the short term i think allen might do is my sense 
but again goes back to saying like you said how much of cash reserve they have how much they're able to plan all the other things in the allied section as well we need a couple of more questions uh, one coming in uh, rising salary cuts and employee layoffs will travel not become a luxury very interesting take yes it might become a luxury right but uh, at the same point in time it's also uh, like you you you've been you mentioned it two or three times that it's people have a pent up demand it will become essential for you to recover like people want to travel i mean for for the last half few hundred years people have been want i mean not hundred for thousands of years people have wanted to travel and explore new destination so it will be a luxury maybe we might take fewer trips because it's more expensive but i think travel will be there like people will be traveling I think that point also where people will start. I think moving one or two levels below, right? So people who could afford international trip might start doing something domestic. Domestic could become staycation. I think, like you said, this is a larger pent up uh, frustration of just being holed up within your house. I mean, you're just waiting to kind of just go and and maybe be back with nature or beaches, depending on one's uh, interest. And you might take fewer trips as well, right? Uh, for example, uh, and maybe spend more on a trip. Uh, you might spend on a luxury hotel on the brand that you know will maintain uh, proper hygiene Safety. and level uh, because uh, and you're willing to pay more, but maybe take one trip instead of two trips a year. Fair, super. I have two personal questions. Uh, I'll kind of wind this up with one. Given that you you come in from the overall northeast space, I think uh, I think it's very underexplored. For a large part of time now, it's slowly coming into contention, right? So, I mean, a quick two-minute talk about from yourself, from the northeast perspective, some great places, some hidden gems that that you think you'd like to share with the audience. So, I mean, I think nowadays there are very few hidden gems with the internet, <laughs> uh, but uh, see, and the supporter the, community. Uh, what the internet? Uh, what the northeast lacks is in terms of infrastructure, right? Arunachal Pradesh is uh, like a lovely, lovely destination, right? Everyone should be going there, and I think uh, it could compete with any international destination that you want. Uh, the problem is that getting there is uh, uh, is very, very difficult, right? Uh, so I think we need to work. Uh, I mean, I think, and I think the government is taking note note of that and trying to work on having more and more flights, more and more and more uh, increasing the road connectivity. Uh, so I think Arunachal Pradesh. You could go to Tawang. You, I mean, they have the Hornbill Festival there. I'm not sure if this, the festivals happen anymore, uh, but uh, I think Arunachal is one great place. And Meghalaya, where I come from, I think it's beautiful. It's uh, I think these are places where you can actually practice social distancing without make without any government regulations or effort because they're largely unexplored. They're not as many tourists as you would expect in other places. And when what sometimes some of the best uh, shoulder seasons you would recommend. What would they be? Sure, for Arunachal or for uh, for, for Meghalaya. Meghalaya. For Meghalaya, you will probably go. I think March is a great time, right? Before summer picks up, we we pass March right now. Uh, you could also go around August when it's rainy. Uh, you could go to Cherrapunji. It's one of the, it was uh, had the highest rainfall in the world. Rainfall, yeah. Uh, so you could go there. Uh, it uh, you will have very few tourists again. Uh, there are some accommodation homestays available, uh, which I guess in the rainy season would be much much easier for you to uh, uh, go to. Okay, uh, if you if you I know you you kind of mentioned that you were part of a board as well, but if you kind of had direct access uh, to the tourism minister of India and you could make three recommendations uh, to improve domestic tourism in India, what would they be? Infrastructure. I mean, just focus on infrastructure, right? Let the companies, uh, let founders like you, uh, get keep the tourists and uh, get people like the Tripura community to popularize it. So that getting creating the demand is not an issue. Supply is always an issue in terms of infrastructure. And I think at this point in time, given COVID nineteen, they need to play a very very important role in terms of uh, allaying people's fears in terms of traveling, right? In terms of uh, we need specific guidelines on. How many people can congregate at one one specific location, and those locations and state governments need to also ensure that those norms are followed, right? You could have maybe, for example, at one uh, people could, uh, I mean, you can't even have lines, right? So you need to think of how many people you allow. So there could be a permit-based sort of entry, uh, and but we really all of the whole industry needs to come together to come up with these guidelines. Uh, so that's uh, I think the government will play a very important role there. And I mean, if I had to give another recommendation, again, infrastructure, right? There's nothing else. That's uh, if you build the infrastructure, uh, not just people from India, but I think people from outside India will also want to come. 
great to sum it up uh, if you have if you could travel what would be your first place you travel after covid where you going to go anywhere in the world anywhere in the world yes i'd go back to maldives i think yeah okay Or i think I that's i would go to his pench i would go to pench national park i loved uh, the whole uh, feel of being in a forest and being uh, trying to spot a tiger so we never spotted one when we went there last time but uh, hopefully this time <laughs> super great thank you for joining us michael it was super fun having you and i think we had a amazing conversation thank you viewers for joining in as well stay safe and have enjoy the rest of the weekend thanks thank you. nice bye 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 ciao